All right. Good evening once again. Our topic tonight is QRP antennas. Uh, George Zafiropoulos, I think it's right, KJ6VU, is the co-host of one of the most popular ham radio podcasts, the Ham Radio Workbench. George uh, has a passion for ultralight portable QRP antennas. He was instrumental in creating a lightweight, compact, portable HF antenna system known as the Pactenna, ideal for operating on the trail at campsites on field days, soda activations, or HOA restricted locations. I personally have been using one for several years. George took, uh, took his time to meet me in a parking lot up in uh, Northern California to give, you my, give me uh, my antenna. So please welcome George. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm hopefully sharing my screen. Can you guys see what looks like a PowerPoint slide? Yep, looks good. Oh, okay, awesome, great. Uh, well, first off, Brad, thank you so much. Uh, it was uh, really nice of you guys to invite me to, to come talk. I'm happy to do it. Um, this is one of the topics that, that uh, I'm personally really interested in myself. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about kind of my journey around designing these antennas and, and what we do with them. So uh, basically, this is kind of two presentations in one. It's, it's both a description of the antennas that we make commercially and, uh, and, but more importantly, it's kind of like how these sort of antennas work, whether you buy a commercial antenna. All right, well done. So whether you buy a commercial antenna or you decide to make, make your own, all these antennas are actually pretty easy to make. And so uh, hopefully going through this process, you'll learn a bit about uh, the various kinds of portable antennas that work very effectively um, for uh, QRP or even QRO, but uh, portable kind of setups. So uh, the the angle that I take at this whole subject matter is from a backpacker's perspective. So from when I was a teenager and on, I always really enjoyed backpacking quite a bit. And I was the guy who was um, always cutting the labels out of the back of my shirt to shed weight. So I... I <laughs> I'm always looking for ways to make things smaller and uh, lighter weight and easier to deploy. And so that's kind of the philosophy behind these antennas, which is how do you make small, lightweight, very portable antennas. So just a little bit of my background um, before we jump into that. I was licensed back in 1972, which seems like a very long time ago now. <laughs> I just realized that in a year, I think I, I qualify for whatever the the, the 2X QCWA <laughs> justification is. So um, most of my activity is around uh, designing and building stuff. Um, I uh, really love doing the podcast thing. We can talk a bit more about that in a sec. Um, I make these Pactena antennas and also um, uh, in the ham radio world, m myself and a friend of mine uh, designed and built the um, Sierra radio repeater controllers that are used by big linked radio uh, networks. So my very first station you see at the lower left there, uh, it was a Drake R4B and a Johnson Viking Ranger. Uh, not exactly portable. I think the Viking Ranger must have weighed 100 pounds. It felt like it anyway. And uh, by contrast, today's station, the home station is a Flex, and the portable station is a uh, uh, IC705 and a KX2. And I have a Lab 599 uh, TX500 on the way. So I'm looking forward to playing with that when it shows up. Uh, oop, I'm sorry, you didn't even see the picture, did you? There I'm talking at it and I didn't realize it even moved the slide forward. There you go. There is my original novice station and uh, the, the current station. So, um, so just a quick touch on the podcast. So we've been uh, producing this podcast for five years and we just uh, posted our 142nd episode. Uh, we put a show out every two weeks. It's generally technically oriented. So it's very much a hands-on builder kind of uh, theme. Uh, we talk about projects and tools and test equipment and um, all kinds of technical aspects of ham radio, everything from software defined radios to stealth antennas to um, operating portable even. So we even squeeze in some operating stuff. And uh, we have a really great crew of guys with a tremendous amount of experience 
from a lot of different facets in amateur radio. So I'm very lucky. I have a team of four other guys who work with me on the podcast and, um, and, and they're just a super crowd. So if you get a chance, we'd love you to listen to it. Um, so now let's, let's hop into this whole portable antenna thing. So what started me going down this path was the search for a very effective portable HF antenna system for a whole variety of different uses, for camping, for backpacking, for field day, and even for travel. And what all of these different applications have in common is that you're always trying to squeeze out weight and reduce the size because you don't really have a lot of spare space in your luggage or in your uh, backpack or you know wh whatever you're using to carry the stuff around. And so size and weight are really, really important factors. Um, so for me here in the Northern California, this is kind of a typical uh, trail operation here. This is a, the local Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, strangely enough, on a trail, I bumped into a nice park bench. I didn't even know there was one up there. Uh, but we have a lovely, you know, lovely forest to operate out of. And a, a typical setup is something like this. Uh, this is an older picture with a KX3. Um, I don't really take the KX3 anymore. I'd take the KX2 because uh, it's a little bit smaller and lighter weight. But usually an external battery like a, a lithium iron phosphate battery and then some lightweight coax and antennas uh, to operate. So, you know, something fairly, fairly compact. Here you can see that little RG316 coax going up to my hiking pole. And then uh, that coax goes up a few more feet to an end fed. And then the wire is strung up in the tree. So this is kind of a, a, a typical um, kind of portable operating that I like to do. So when I started going down this path, I looked at uh, the different kinds of commercial antennas that one could purchase, because I thought, well, surely if you spray enough money at the problem, you can get a phenomenally perf well-performing antenna. And so I tried uh, pretty much every portable antenna on the market. I think I have owned at one point or another every one of these antennas that you see on the picture here. And I came to some pretty, um, fundamental conclusions having tried all of these antennas. And what it all boiled down to was they were all too big, too heavy, and in most cases were really a compromise in performance. So a lot of times when we look at uh, making antennas portable, we tend to shrink them. And when you shrink an antenna, they become less efficient, especially at the lower frequencies. So that's a problem or they're very big. I mean, they're really not designed for trail use. They're really designed for putting in the trunk of your car, driving to the park and then walking 50 feet and setting it up. But that's really not the, you know, the main operating MO for me. So I, I'd prefer to find something that I could really carry. So one of the inspirations for what I ultimately came up with was my favorite field day antenna. Uh, my club does field day. We've done it for 20 odd plus years. And uh, one of the antennas that we set up at field day every year is a multi-band vertical antenna. This is a fiberglass pole, and we run a piece of wire up that pole. It's about 30 feet long. And at the base of that, that vertical pole, we have a, um, a plastic ammo can. And inside that box is a wide range random wire antenna tuner. We use an SGC tuner. And then we string out a bunch of radials on the ground and then run the coax. Um, and power back from the radios. And the beauty of this antenna is it takes about 10 minutes to set it up. You can work every band and it takes you about five minutes to pull the whole thing down. So that seemed like kind of a winner. Uh, there's something in that that's very appealing. Now, taking an ammo can and 16 radials or whatever was not very appealing um, in a very portable station, but at least there is a, a concept here. The other inspiration was from a book by this guy, Ryan Jordan, and um, he really has an ethos around thinking like a backpacker and he boils it down to seven things. And, and I thought that all of these points of view really resonated with me around antenna uh, design as well. So his whole thing is like, weigh all the bits and pieces that you backpack with, get rid of everything you don't need, plan out what you're gonna do and what you need and how it's gonna work. If you have a choice, take the lightest possible thing that'll do the job, simplify your systems, and just don't bring um, a bunch of random stuff, build a system of interchangeable parts, and don't create more complication than you need to. So all of his sort of philosophical points rang true to me from a radio field operating perspective as well. 
So I kind of thought, okay, well, there's this big multi-band vertical wire antenna. There's this notion of trimming it down. What, you know, how would you do that? So I, I set out to um, try to figure out what I could build. And I was really looking not to make something to sell it. I was really looking to just make antennas for myself. So I had a set of design goals. Number one is um, operating QRP, I don't want to use heavily loaded shortened antennas because full size antennas are both more efficient, but they're also a broader band. In other words, not only do you not need a tuner, if it's a resonant antenna, you can work the entire band. You don't need to trim it at all. Um, I wanted to pick lightweight components. So the backpacking world is uh, chock full of ultralight stuff. Uh, you know, there's a lot of metal stuff that's all built out of titanium, like spoons and plates and cups and such. Um, nylon is very lightweight. The, the kind of very fine paracord is very lightweight, et cetera. So lightweight is a theme. And at the same time, just like backpacking, I wanted the hardware to be robust. In other words, it has to withstand the rigors of taking to the field and using repeatedly and dropping it and stepping on it and uh, hopefully having it survive uh, the kind of abuse that you, you, you'll give it in the field. I wanted a modular system so I can have a variety of different antenna configurations because where you set up isn't always the same. Sometimes you can set up any old big antenna you want. Sometimes you have a very small space. And this is particularly true when you're traveling. If you're if you're staying in a in a hotel or something, you don't have a whole lot of space to set up an antenna. Very important was really number five, and that is I wanted this to be really easy to set up because if it took me an hour to assemble the antenna, I'm just not going to do it. It's I, you know I don't want to spend an hour assembling it, using it for an hour, and then spending another hour taking it down. That's just pointless. So my goal was to set up and pull down the whole station in five minutes, max. And so it, the whole thing kind of had to be easy. So with those goals in mind, I picked a few key uh, attributes of the system. The first is to get the efficiency and the broadbanded uh, behavior that I wanted, I felt like I really needed to use wire elements. Why wire? Wire is small, compact, lightweight, and it could be very efficient. And you can make resonant or non-resonant antennas, depending on the radio you've got. So wire makes a lot of sense, rather than a bunch of aluminum, which is heavy, bulky. And by the way, when your aluminum telescopic antenna falls over, it's got a good chance of breaking. So that's not good. So wire is pretty resilient. The second thing is I found a 10 meter tall fiberglass pole. This really was the game changer for coming up with these designs. When I first started this, I was looking at these um, telescopic uh, fiberglass masts, very common ones for using uh, with wind socks. So there's a company called Jack Kite that's very popular. Uh, they made a 28 foot um, telescopic fiberglass mast. And that was great, except that when it collapsed down, it would collapse down to about four feet long. And that's just too big and unwieldy on the trail. Plus, it was kind of heavy. I found um, a, a mast that was 32 and a half feet or 10 meters tall when fully erected. And when you collapsed it, would collapse down to about 26 inches. And 26 inches was really uh, an amazingly small package. And that telescopic mast has about 17 sections in it. And you can pull up as many of the sections as you like. but um, but that was really a game changer. So why is why is 33 feet a magic number for your antenna support, or for that matter, the length of your antenna? Well, obviously it's because you've got a 40 meter quarter wave ground plane without trying very hard. And so most of the bands that I operate on portable are 20 and 40, occasionally 30. Um, I like other bands too, but 80% of the time I'm on 20 or 40. Those are really the money bands. So if you have a, a 10 meter long fiberglass mast and a bunch of wire, you can build almost anything. You could build a dipole, you could build a ground plane, well, for 20 meters and up anyway. You could build an inverted V, you could build delta loops, you can do a sloper, you could do just about anything. So that seemed like it was a, a pretty good start. So the first generation of the antennas that I built uh, are pictured here. And it's a system that includes a feed point. In this case, there's a one-to-one -one, um, uh, ballon. 
so your your coax comes into the bottom and then you have um, both the both sides of the transformer the one-to-one -one, uh, transformer that goes to the wire elements uh, subsequently the the newer versions are smaller uh, and a little bit lighter weight uh, but I really want to design kind of a whole system uh, out of this and so I, I came up with a design for the feed points which is really the most sort of novel part of the whole antenna is uh, coming up with uh, a way to connect the coax to a central feed point that has multiple connections that allow you to make all of those different wire antennas that I showed you on the previous page. So currently we have uh, four different, uh, well, three feed points and a choke uh, in, in our product line. The first one you see there is a is an inverted V or dipole. So this is a, a traditional link dipole where there's a one-to-one ballon um, on the feed point. And you can see all of the antennas uh, are an X shape. And the reason there's an X shape there is because the feed point is a winder um, along with the, the, you know, as one unit, because you wanna keep things small and, and nice and neat. Um, you'll also notice that, uh, maybe you can't tell in, this, in these angles, but the wire is all uh, wound up in a uh, back and forth, uh, like figure eight pattern. And if you do that, the wire doesn't rotate and doesn't kink up. So that's a great way to store the wire and it just unfolds and doesn't get all uh, kinked up. So uh, one option is an inverted V dipole, which is a resonant antenna, does not require a tuner. Second one is a, um, is a nine to one feed point, which allows you to tune essentially any band with a tuner, if a tuner is required. The third antenna is the same form factor, but it's a 49 to one uh, unun, which allows you to operate an N-fed half wave, which is a resonant antenna, no tuner required. And then for some installations, you might want a current choke, and that's what the thing is over to the far right without a, without its insulating cover over it, so the cover is removed. So it's a, uh, essentially it's a current choke that reduces RFI coming back from the antenna. So uh, this is what the current lineup looks like. Um, we, we're really lucky that we have kind of a, um, a, a very enthusiastic following so, you know, like any specialty, specialty in ham radio, uh, if you're really into something, um, you, you get a whole bunch of people who start to follow you if it's any good. And if you go on YouTube and just do a search for Pactena, there's like a huge number of videos. We've, we've never really made a video about the products, but we're very lucky that there's a whole bunch of people that use them and they like them enough to make videos about them. So we're very grateful for that. Um, my very favorite example of this, there, there's several, but uh, there's a fellow named uh, uh, Carlos who's in the Midwest who does um, ham radio while parachuting. So he'll go jump on an airplane, he'll unfurl a 20 meter N-fed half wave and he'll work 20 meter sideband as he's drifting down to the ground. And uh, he's used several of our antennas uh, but there's a lot of other examples too, so it, it's really fun to, to see what people have done with them. Now, when we talk up these antennas, uh, I want to stress that everything in our antenna designs, there's nothing new. There's no magic secret sauce. There's no um, proprietary circuit. There's nothing technically unique about these antennas. And I want to emphasize that because you can build any of these antennas yourself. So if you don't really have the time and just want one off the shelf, that's great. If you want to build something, these are fantastic projects to just build yourself on a weekend. Uh, so if you build them, they could be fairly inexpensive. They'll work just as good as ones that you buy. And if you have a copy of the handbook, all of these designs are in the handbook. You can find all of them. So there's no magic here. And anybody who's trying to sell you an antenna that is somehow um, will give you better performance because you spent a lot of money, <laughs> that's not true. So um, so there's nothing new in, in these antennas that you can't see you know, in a handbook from the 30s. So by all means, um, you know, feel free to, uh, to build your own. So um, let me walk through electrically what these antennas are and whether you buy one or build one, it's good to understand how they operate uh, because there's a whole lot of misconceptions and misunderstanding and bogus information out there about some of these antennas. So let's start with a, a dipole, like a resonant antenna. So a dipole is a great reference antenna. Why is it a good antenna? Um, it's inexpensive. They're fairly broadband, meaning within the band they're cut for, you generally don't have to worry about where it's cut. You cut it for the middle of the band and it'll be fine. 
as you go down in frequency to 80 meters, 80 meters is a very large band, 500 kilohertz wide, at a frequency of 3.5 megahertz, which means on a percentage basis, that's a lot of turf to cover. So even a dipole cut on uh, 80 meters will will tend to have a, a, a more sweet spot and a worse spot on the band. But by the time you get to 40 meters and up, then a full half wave dipole will be resonant enough across the band to perform without the need of a tuner. Now, the other effect, of course, you have with a horizontal antenna is uh, the closer you get to ground, um, then the more the radiation pattern tends to go up, not out. So that's another uh, consideration, but that's true for any kind of a horizontal antenna. So a typical half-wave dipole has got a quarter wavelength at the desired frequency on either side. And, uh, and then the feed point impedance is about 72 ohms for such an antenna. Now, with the, um, with the approach that we took with making these, uh, these balanced feed points, uh, with the mast I was talking about, you can make some interesting portable antennas with that. You could, for example, make an inverted V. An inverted V, in, it, for portable operating, a dipole is really difficult to set up because you need two supports. You could usually find one, like a mast that you bring yourself, which all, where all the weight and the mass is, is on the mast itself. If you had two masts and you're trying to do a dipole, they're really going to bend in. So that's a more difficult thing to do. So a lot of people doing portable operation will just do an inverted V, it's much easier. So you only need one center support and that center support could be ground mounted like a mast or it could be a rope you toss in a tree and you hoist up the feed point and then you can create your, your V or your inverted V. And so long as the ends of the inverted V are at least three feet or so off the ground and the, the angle of the V is between 90 and 120 degrees for the most part, you're gonna be just fine. And, and these are really good performing antennas. So when we make these um, commercially, we make wire elements that have a stress uh, relieving loop in them. So we use these little plastic carabiners to clip the wires to the, um, the, the center feed point. And then we use gold plated banana connectors to make the electrical connection. Uh, the reason we use the banana connectors is because they have a very high surface area. And so even in the field, if they get dirty, uh, you can always get a good RF connection with them. They're uh, fairly readily available. You can always replace them with some other kind of connector if you prefer. Um, and then we use crimp on ferrules to make that loop and provide the strain relief. So there's never any strain on the actual banana connector itself. It's only on, on the wire element. So this is a, a picture. We don't use these ferrules. This is a little uh, prototype but you can see the, um, um, how the strain is taken by the carabiner and then the, uh, the link is made there at the connection. If you're just putting up a 20 meter inverted V, you don't really even have a link. You just have two quarter wave segments. If you're gonna do a 40 meter, 20 meter combo antenna, then you can take two 20 meter elements, put them in series with a link and you just make the connection or break the connection to change bands. And there's, there's, no, um, there's nothing more complicated than that about it. And you can make wire elements for any combination of bands that, that you like. Another thing you could do with these kind of elements is do a vertical like a ground plane. This is uh, easily done on 20 meters with a 32 uh, and a half foot mast. You can put the feed point in the middle and your guys uh, essentially are your, your radials for the ground plane and then a vertical radiator wire that runs up the mast. So those are just some sort of typical kind of configurations for um, a dipole center fed kind of an antenna. Um, I'm gonna shift gears from dipoles that most everybody understands dipoles and start uh, talking about NFED antennas. Um, NFED antennas to me are kind of an interesting subject because when I first got my license and probably for the first 30 years of my having a license, I didn't know a soul that used an NFED antenna. I'm sure people did, but in the last 10 to 20 years, I'd say, the NFED antenna has become incredibly popular. And I attribute that to the big interest in portable operating. When, when I was a younger ham and wanted to operate portable, there weren't very many good options. Most of the portable radios were really terrible. <laughs> and and, uh, and they were even big at that. So, you know, a good QRP, well, a QRP radio in my era was an HW7, or an HW8 or an Argonaut 509. 
Uh, the HW7s and 8s were awful radios. I apologize if you own one, but they're just flat out lousy radios. The uh, Argonaut 509 was not a bad radio, but you know, it's like a foot long and nine inches deep and four inches tall. I mean, it's not something you're gonna put in a backpack. So now that there's so many great, truly wonderful portable radios and an NFED antenna is very convenient. And so we see a huge surge of interest in NFED antennas. So it's important to understand how these damn things work. <laughs> so this is too easy to be confused by them. So what I wanna do is dispel a few of the myths and talk about how they actually work here. So the first thing I wanna do is, is let's, let's talk about uh, feed point impedance. So if there's a point at which you wanna go get a glass of water, perhaps this is the time. So let's talk a little bit about how these things work. So I mentioned before a uh, half wave dipole has a feed point impedance of about 72 ohms. Now our transmitters are 50 ohms, our coax is 50 ohms, the antenna is 72 ohms, close enough. So that's close enough. So any uh, radio with a built-in tuner, no matter how basic, will tune that out easily. If you have a tube type transmitter, the tank circuit will tune that out, no problem at all. Um, but if you don't even have a tuner, you're not that far off. Your, your SWR will be, not 1.1 to one, but you know, you're probably looking at a 1.7 to one or something like that. It's nothing to worry about. It's perfectly fine. Now, what happens if you start moving that feed point to one end? If you move the feed point, let's say in this case to the left-hand side, what you'll notice is that the feed point impedance starts to go up. So an example of that is a off-center fed dipole where you're gonna feed the antenna at about a third in from the end, more or less, uh, the feed point impedance of such an antenna is about 200 ohms. So as you can see, when we move off the center to one end, the impedance starts to go up. If you keep moving to the very end of the wire, at the very end of the wire, you'll be at the very highest feed point impedance of that half wave wire. Now the the feed point impedance of, an, of a half wave is generally somewhere between about 3,000 and 5,000 ohms, which is a far cry from our 50 ohm transmitter. So the transmitter wants to see 50, it's seeing something that's 4,000, that's a big difference. And so you have a problem. The first problem you have is you have a huge impedance mismatch and so you have to fix that. The second problem you might notice is, what happened to my counterpoise? Because <laughs> if you look at a, a typical dipole, the center of the coax goes to one side, the shield goes to the other side. The shield side is the counterpoise for the driven side, for the right-hand side. That forms the whole antenna. So the RF alternating current has to have two things to work against. You know, it's, a, it's, it's essentially an RF voltage. So you need to have two things for the, that RF energy to work against. If you eliminate one of them, it seems like that's a problem. So what happens to the counterpoise? So to solve these two issues, the first thing is to bring down the impedance, I need a transformer. Just like in an audio circuit, if you have a, uh, let's say a 600 ohm audio source and an eight ohm speaker, you need a transformer to bring that down. Now, why do you need a transformer? You need a transformer because you wanna maximize the energy transfer. You could leave your 4,000 ohm antenna connected to your 50 ohm transmitter and except for the fact the transmitter may shut off or, or you might damage your finals, the biggest problem, the reason you don't wanna do that is because it's extremely inefficient and a small amount of energy will get radiated. And the whole point is to get all of your energy to radiate. And when we're operating portable and QRP, we don't have a lot of energy to begin with. So, you know, my five watts, you know, every one of those five watts better make it to the antenna or as much of it as I can get up there and get it radiated. I don't want any of that energy coming back towards the radio. So the transformer by matching the impedance will allow the maximum amount of energy to be transferred to the antenna and thus radiated. So what happens to the counterpoise? Um, you better believe there is one there. You just don't know where it is yet. So the RF energy is gonna go somewhere and it's going to uh, essentially find its ground or counterpoise side to couple uh, to and it just may not be what you want and it certainly may not be the effect that you want So let's talk a little bit about how this is actually going to work So let's take the NFED random wire antenna. These are super duper popular antennas. Why are these popular antennas? These are the lazy man's antenna 
And I say that because it's one of my very favorite antennas. I qualify as that guy. And the reason it's a great antenna is because it'll work on absolutely any band if you have a tuner, a good tuner, a wide range tuner. So what does a nine to one unun do? By the way, what's an unun? Unun is an unbalanced to unbalanced uh, coupler. And why is it unbalanced? Coaxial cable is not balanced. That's one un. A single wire with, a, with some sort of counterpoise is also unbalanced. So that's an un-un, because you're essentially trying to transfer that energy to that radiating element. A, a nine to one un-un, a transformer with a nine to one impedance ratio will take your, let's say 4,000 ohm NFED antenna and bring it down to, let's say, Five, 500 ohms, well within the tuning range of a good wide range tuner. So this essentially does part of the impedance transformation to bring it from a very high impedance down to a sort of high impedance, and then your, your tuner handles the rest of it. Now you might say, well, why in the world can I just use my tuner? Why do I need this nine to one? Well, in some cases you don't need the nine to one. In some cases you could just put a piece of wire on your wide range tuner and go to town. And um, depending on the frequency that you're on and the length of the wire, we'll have uh, the main determinant as to what the impedance is. So I'm describing the worst case scenario where a nine to one would under pretty much all circumstances let you tune the antenna. Um, you may be fortunate and pick a length of wire and a frequency where the tuner can handle it close enough. So like for instance, if you put up um, a 31 foot piece of wire and you wanna operate on 40 meters, you're pretty close to a quarter wave you're probably not far off, and even your built-in tuner will handle that. But here, we want to be able to operate any band. So you see in the little diagram down there, uh, I'm sitting at the park bench with my radio. I've got some coax that runs up to the unun, and then the, um, the red line is the wire itself. In this scenario, there is a counterpoise. You just aren't aware of it, and the counterpoise is actually the shield of your coax. So what happens is the RF energy goes up the coax between the outer skin of the center conductor and the inner skin of the shield. That's where that high frequency RF energy is. And it travels up the coax and hopefully gets radiated. Now, the outer shield of the coax essentially becomes your counterpoise, in, in effect, creating kind of a coaxial dipole. Um, the other thing that happens is, if there's excessive energy, it's going to come back down the feed line. So if you have a perfect match, the energy will go all the way to the end of the coax, all the energy will get radiated, and you'll have all the forward energy and zero reflected energy. If you don't have a perfect match, you will get some reflected energy coming back from that, um, from that antenna. Too much reflected energy will cause problems. Too much reflected energy will damage your radio, will cause radio frequency interference into the stuff around you like lights and, and uh, other electronics and speakers and stuff like that. The more power you run, the worse the match is, the more energy is coming right back at you and it's gonna disrupt your electronics right around you. So that's something you need to be aware of. Um, the length of the wire that you use in a random wire antenna is not totally random. Um, you want to avoid a half wavelength because a half wavelength is the worst case scenario. That's the highest impedance. So anything not a half wavelength, even though it's not resonant, will at least be lower impedance. So it's easier to match. So there's a few magic numbers that you see on the slide there, 29, 35, 41, 58, 71 feet. Why are those magic numbers? Because if you think about all the amateur bands in the HF spectrum, 80 meters, 60 meters, 40 meters, 20 meters, 17, 15, et cetera. If you said, are there any wire lengths that are not a half wave multiple on any of those bands? And the answer is yes, there are. And that's what those are. Those are lengths of wire that won't be a half wave on any amateur band. What that means is that those are a safe bet for the length of wire for your random wire antenna. Um, in my case, when I'm using a, a 10 meter mast and I wanna do a quick setup and I don't have a lot of footprint to dangle a sloper, then I use 29 feet of wire. And 29 feet works great on 40 meters and up and it's okay on 80. Not great, but it's better than nothing. If I had the room to stretch out a longer wire, then I would go to let's say 41 or 58 feet and it would work bang up on 80 meters and everything else as well. 
Um, the other thing that you really want to think about is how much energy are you running and what's the likelihood of those uh, RF currents flowing back towards your radio. To prevent RF energy from getting back to your radio, this is where the choke comes in. You can put a choke in the feed line. That If you put the choke in the middle of your feed line, the upper half of your feed line remains your counterpoise, essentially the ground side of your antenna system. The lower half of the coax that, that's going from the choke to the radio is essentially isolated from that radiation. Now, it's actually, the radiation is attenuated. It's not totally eliminated, but it's attenuated by, um, you know, 30, 40 dB. So it's so much that it's, a, it's effectively uh, eliminated from the circuit. So just the other day, I, I had a, um, I was in the garage playing with an antenna. Um, it, it happened to be a resonant half wave. Um, and I was using an 857, running about 50 watts. And when I would transmit, my LED lamp sitting next to the radio would turn on or turn off, depending on what, you know, when I'm keying. And by sticking the choke in series, it, it just eliminated that. So it's a very easy, quick and dirty way to eliminate RFI getting back into your station. This is, a, is equally applicable to setting up an antenna at home. If you put up an NFED half wave or an NFED random wire at home, you really have to be very conscious about what you're using as your counterpoise and choking that stray RF to keep it out of the shack where you really don't want it. Um, when you're running QRP, five watts, 10 watts, that's almost never a problem. You really don't need a choke if you're running QRP. If you're running 100 watts, there's a pretty good chance you're probably gonna need a choke. Anywhere in between your mileage may vary. You may be lucky. Uh, or you may be unlucky, and having a choke in your kit is usually a good thing just in case. Another thing you could do is you can add additional wires to create additional counterpoise elements. I get this question like at least once a week, someone says, should I put wires, uh, on, well, the way we make our antennas, there's extra banana jacks for counterpoise wires. So everybody always asks, you know, if I put wires on there, is it going to perform any better? No. If I put wires on there, is it going to keep the RF energy from coming down the coax back to the radio? Probably not. <laughs> so, so why in the world would you put counterpoise elements on the feed point? Um, and the answer is nine times out of 10, it will make absolutely no difference whatsoever. And so I generally don't recommend people do it, but you can certainly experiment and see if under your circumstances it helps. A lot of times with these antennas, their performance and behavior depends on what's around it. So if you're out in a field with nothing around you for a mile, you'll have a very different experience than if you're in a suburban environment where you have structures five feet away from you. You know, I've got a stucco building with chicken wire in it is going to give me a very different behavior than a field with nothing but trees. So your mileage will vary as to what the where the RF gets coupled. So those extra counterpoise wires may or may not make any difference at all. Some people put the choke right at the unun. I mean, literally, the end of the coax goes to the choke, the choke goes to the feed point, and at the feed point, you string out your wires. That's actually a pretty good practice. I, I don't know that it's really worth bothering with, to be honest, but it's, it's kind of an ideal way to do it if you want to take the time. But usually, it's not convenient, so I usually don't bother with that. Let me talk about the other very popular kind of NFED antenna, and that's a resonant antenna called an NFED half wave. An NFED half wave, by definition, is resonant on a frequency uh, that you're going to decide or a band that you're going to pick. Um, and as we said before, the feed point impedance of a half wave is very high. It's going to be four or 5,000 ohms. So in that case, if I'm going to bring that antenna impedance down to 50 ohms, I need a very high transformation ratio. So I'm going to use, uh, let's say, for example, a very popular one like the one we use is a 49 to 1 transformer. So with 49 to 1, you can take several thousand ohms and bring it down to 50 ohms. And all you have to do to tune it is just adjust the length of the wires. You know, put too much wire on at about a half wavelength and start snipping it off until the antenna tunes to where you want it. What you'll typically find if you, if you tune, let's say, an NFED 20 meter half wave to the middle of the band, you can get an SWR of 1.1 pretty easily. Um, again, your mileage may vary, depends on what's in the close by the antenna, if there's coupling or whatever. But it's you can really dial it in really well. And if you go to the edge of the band, that you know, at 14.0, 14.35, 
your SWR may be 1.5 to 1, maybe 1 1.6. You know, it's that again, full size antenna element will do that for you. If you had a big loading coil to shorten it physically, uh, not only will you have a less efficient antenna, the Q goes way up, which means it's a much more narrow band antenna, and and that your um, the edges of your bands will be much worse. So then you have to think, okay, do I want to cut this thing for the CW end of the band, the middle of the band, or the phone end of the band? Uh, and then it's suboptimal at the other ends. So um, my advice is don't shorten the antenna. Keep it as a full half wavelength if you can do it. Now, 20 meters, that's no big deal because it's 33 feet. 40 meters is 65, 66 feet. Okay. 80 meters, that's a big antenna. 80 meters, it's 135 feet. Uh, you need a lot of space. So that's something that few of us can do at home, <laughs> I would add. However, if you're out, let's say, at field day, that's an awesome antenna. One of my absolute favorite antennas uh, on field day is a half-wave end fed on 80 meters. In my experience, that antenna, if you can get it up over a bunch of trees, which we do with a, with a pneumatic tennis ball launcher, by the way, if you do that, you've got a full resonant half-wave antenna on 80 with a... Um, with a simple uh, G90 20 watt radio, we worked every station we could hear on an 80 meter sideband on field day, uh, and it's all antenna. It's it's all the size of the antenna. So anyway, the 49 to one is your transformer, similar behavior to the random wire antenna, where the coax is now your counterpoise. The same RF rules apply, five or 10 watts, you're good to go. 100 watts, you're probably gonna get RF coming back towards you. You probably need to consider putting a choke in line for all the exact same reasons as the uh, nine to one uh, random wire antenna. So uh, a choke is your friend uh, in that case. These transformers are really simple. I mentioned before, if, if you just want it, you can buy one from us or somebody else. But if you wanna build your own, you just need a toroidal core and uh, some enameled wire and an hour. <laughs> And you could just make your own antenna. It's it's really that simple. Um, you just take the wire, you twist it together, you do a few turns of the twist, you do a bunch more turns of the individual wire, you solder it to your connector, and you're off to the races. Uh, so they're really very very simple antennas to construct. They make a great club project, by the way. Um, so uh, because you could build it in an evening, um, if you if you could ever get together in person, it would make for a great build project. So this is a, a this is an early picture of the prototype of the the half wave uh, N fed antenna and you can see here at like 14.2 the SWR on the on the meter was like a 1.0 uh, and that's really quite consistent on our you know we we've got better meters than this one now but um, you know they're they're just very very good and um, uh, flat antennas. So as I mentioned before, you know, what if you if you don't have a tree to uh, to to lob your antenna over? Um, my personal favorite thing is to is to bring a mast, uh, as I mentioned before. And one of the reasons for that is it's really easy to put up the antenna in five minutes. Um, I, I actually take a photo tripod and I strap a piece of two inch plastic PVC to it, and I put the mast in there so it just holds it in position. And then I attach the wire to the top of the mast, and I just pull it up section by section, it takes me like a minute, and I, I'm done, I'm on the air. And I, I don't have to worry about having a tree, I don't have to worry about launching it over the tree, and I'm not in anybody's you know space. And when it's time to go, I just drop down the, the mast and I, I'm out of there. So it's really easy to set up. Um, there is an interesting um, choice around the material for a mast. Typically those are either uh, fiberglass or carbon fiber. The big advantage of carbon fiber is it weighs a lot less. Um, a carbon fiber mast is probably a third of the weight of a equivalent size fiberglass mast. And uh, that's a big plus. Having said that, there is a big downside to carbon fiber masts, and that is that they will detune a radiating element. If you take a, a, a piece of wire and you run it up along the side of your fiberglass mast, the fiberglass is completely transparent and invisible to the RF. It's as if it's not even there, and the antenna works just perfectly fine. If you take that same wire and put it right next to a carbon fiber mast, it's going to detune the um, 
the radiator. And the, the funny thing about it is it doesn't shift the frequency. It's not like, oh, we just cut off another foot and it's fine. It actually will not resonate like anywhere well. So it's, it's just a bad idea. Now, having said that, treat a, treat a carbon fiber mast like you would a metal mast and you're fine. So nobody would dream of taking a, like a tower and running a wire up the leg of a tower and, and using that as an antenna. You'd never do that, right? Just intuitively, you don't think it would work. Same thing with carbon fiber. So if you use uh, a carbon fiber mast as a, as a support for a sloper, where maybe the, the, the top of the mast is where your wire is connected and it dangles diagonally away from the mast, then it'll work fine. Then it's just like having a sloper coming off a tower. It'll work just fine and dandy. So just bear that in mind and, and you'll, you'll be in good shape. This is a picture of the way I set mine up. Um, the red bag is a weight bag. There's about uh, five or 10 pounds of um, uh, workout weights inside there. So, you know, the typical thing is to use guys to guy your mast to the ground. Well, that works great if you're on grass. <laughs> And, and if you're at a place where the park ranger will let you stake things into the grass, that's fine. If you're on an asphalt parking lot doing a demonstration, there's no place to stake anything out. So I just bring my own mount. So I, I have a couple of these photo tripods. And the cool thing about these tripods is a lot of them now, um, the older tripods would, would go out to a fixed position and have an interconnecting thing that keeps them in position. The newer tripods will allow you to go out to a, um, a wider angle. So you can have it like this or, or further out so that um, you can decide how you want to distribute the, the, the load, the weight. And then to hold it in place, I just have a weight bag and I just uh, carabiner clip it on. And that just puts downward uh, force on the tripod and it won't fall over. It, you know, If it falls over, then you better leave because it's pretty windy. Uh, and then I have a... Um, a, a, a two and a half inch piece of uh, plastic like PVC that I connect to that tripod and I just slip the mast up in there and it holds it perfectly fine. And the beauty of this setup is that uh, this is part of what helps me set something up like for a field day in five minutes. If I'm on the trail, I'm not gonna bring this weight bag for sure and I'm probably not gonna bring a tripod. So I would probably be looking at the tree uh, to toss a wire into it or possibly have the mast and just jam it into some rocks or something. So it's not as convenient, but it, you don't quite have the weight either. So here you can see the top of the tripod. Uh, if you buy the right kind of tripod, you can unscrew the pan and tilt head and just put it aside somewhere. And you usually have a three inch stud that sticks up out of the, the top of that tripod. And I just put an L bracket and a wing nut and some hose clamps and attach it together and it's, it's super strong. So um, that's kind of the, uh, the end of the presentation. I'll just sort of close out on um, when do you use these antennas? Like why, why do you need three antennas? Well, you don't need three antennas, you need one antenna. Um, but it just sort of depends on the radios you've got and, and your style of operating. Um, if you have an antenna that's got a big wide range tuner, like an Elecraft KX2 or a KX3, um, I found the most popular antenna is a random wire, an NFED. In fact, a lot of times you'll see Wayne uh, from Elecraft with just a BNC connector and a piece of wire and the tuner just tunes it without having a nine to one and it works fine. And that's often the case. Um, I, I like using the nine to one because it gives me a place to wind the wire to begin with, but also I know I can really tune absolutely anything. I don't have to be lucky, it'll, it'll just work. If you have a radio, like many of these new radios that have don't have tuners in them, like an ICOM 705 or a Lab 599 or many other radios or older radios like a 817, um, you could bring an outboard tuner. You could bring a little Elecraft uh, tuner or there's zillions of little QRP tuners. Uh, I'm a big fan of a Z-Match by uh, MTech. Uh, we can talk about that if you want. Um, they'll tune kind of anything. Um, but if you have a uh, inverted V dipole or an NFED half wave, you don't need a tuner. And you just make sure the antenna is tuned up to begin with, and then you're done. You don't need a tuner, it works great. Uh, if you're using a higher powered radio, like a 100 watt radio, 7300, uh, FT891, any one of you know a zillion other 100 watt radios, 
then you really want to use a resonant antenna like an inverted V. If you use an NFED antenna like the NFED half wave, you really want to have a choke. This is really where the choke is absolutely a necessity. In the other cases, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but certainly at 100 watts, you're going to need a choke. So those are a few recommendations uh, for, for rigs and antennas. And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. All right. If there's some questions, uh, raise your hand and I'll try to find it or unmute and blast out. I'm not hearing any. I got a question. Go ahead, James. Hi. Um, in your picture, you have a, I don't know, helium balloon or whatever with a wire coming off. Have you ever done that? Is that something, uh, you know, just curious? Yeah, yes, I have. And I don't recommend cool. it. <laughs> so we, we, we did try that. Um, we've, we've tried kites and we've tried helium balloons. And so we went to the party store and got yeah. one of those green tanks of helium because they're cheap. Yeah. And we got a big Mylar balloon and we filled it up. And one Mylar balloon is not so good, but a couple Mylar balloons is pretty good. Uh -huh. And so we could get plenty of loft. That wasn't the problem. And we weren't run, you know, really tiny wire, so it's fine. The problem is that uh, if you're in completely still wind conditions, it's fine. But if you get any breeze at all, that thing is, is it, it's not like moving a little bit like this. It's like bending, you know, it's like horizontal practically. So we just, it was just a pain. Yeah. Um, we played with kites uh, also, uh, and if you're at the beach and you've got a pretty consistent wind and you get one of those big, uh, like, um, uh, Delta kites that are the, the kind you just let go and they go and they just stay there. Those actually are pretty good platforms for antenna wire. Um, but the only problem is you got to be careful. You don't like, you know, tangle stuff up, yeah. which inevitably happens. So, I, you know, they're fun to experiment with, but I, I haven't found them to be terribly practical. Thank you. Sure. All right. Other questions, uh, Joe? Yeah. Um, what kind of uh, toroid do you use? Because I, I see they're all different styles and sizes of those toroids. Is, is there a specific one that uh, gives you the big whoop? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's a secret. I have to indoctrinate you into the loyal order of the toroid before I can divulge the mystical secrets. All right, well, so I'll this, pop the, that pimple. <laughs> so the funny thing is, if you crack open the handbook, all will be revealed. They really do a fine job in about a page and a half of explaining all this. You can find uh, websites that are um, extremely uh, technically detailed and very useful and really dry and boring. But I can tell you what it boils down to is this. Um, there's different mix types. First of all, there's powdered iron cores, and then there's ferrites. And ferrites are a variety of different ferrous materials in different blends, um, where those blends have a frequency response characteristics. And you pick one, they call them types. You pick, you pick a type um, based on the permeability of the material that you need for the application, and also the frequency range where you want to have the effect. So uh, for ham radio purposes, for HF ham radio purposes, the two most popular kinds of, uh, of, of uh, ferrite materials are type 31 and type 43. For practical purposes, you can kind of use either one. So if you're gonna build, um, let's say a, a, a ballon for your dipole, should you use 31 or 43? And the answer is both will work. They have extremely broad frequency overlap in practicality. The general, generally speaking, the specifications for type 31 um, are good from like one to 30 megahertz and type 43 from 25 megahertz to 100 something megahertz. Having said that, if you really um, look at their performance across the amateur bands for 80, for anything up to 40 meters, type 31 will be more optimum. For 20 meters, or really 30 meters and up in frequency, type 43 will be more optimum. Now, it turns out that of the two, if you had to pick one to do everything, type 43 is probably a better choice. So I would use a type 43. 
some of the antennas like the uh, the nine to ones don't use ferrites at all they use powdered iron core uh, cores primarily and it has to do with the saturation of the the permeability of the dev of the of the core it's it's a long story let's just suffice to say that that for the most part type 43 is your friend I'd start with that um, now that's for making a transformer if you're going to make a choke the same frequency comments apply to making chokes. Um, so where you, where you want to choke out frequencies, the um, the resonant frequency of the choke is a function of the material you're using and the type of coax you're using to wind through the core and the number of turns. And as you vary the you know, different kinds of coax have different capacitance, et cetera, and different uh, number of turns will change the resonant frequency of the, of the core. Um, like most things, more is better. <laughs> So uh, if you're going to put, let's say, let's say you got an RFI problem and you don't want to make this a big science project. You just want to like, I, I got to put a choke on my speakers to get the noise out of my computer speakers. I'd take a type 43 co uh, core and I would wrap the speaker wire through that core probably 10 times. The, it, you know, what, what you find is on a lot of consumer electronics, there's, you, you have the cord and a, and, a, and a bubble that's the ferrite that's on that cord. That, wire is passing through the ferrite once you have one unit of impedance at the target frequency every time you pass a wire through a core it increases the amount of inductance the impedance rather it, it not induct, it increases increases the amount of impedance um, it squares it so you get a much bigger amount of impedance so um, you're better off putting like sometimes you'll see a piece of coax with like five cores on it if you took one core and you wrapped the thing five times you'd have like like 20 times the impedance of the snap-on cores so a snap-on core is like useless in my opinion so if you look at inside my shack uh, or, or any other radio site stuff that i've done um all of the cabling that gets the first of all, all the cabling gets ferrites put on it for noise elimination reasons, but there's always like six to, to 12 turns um, on, on the cable through the same core over and over again. Anyway, that's, that's an RFI tip. Um, so by the way, Palomar engineering is your best friend, uh, fair right from DigiKey um, or Mauser. Those are good brands. Um, the guys at, at uh, Amazon Associates is a great source. Uh, I buy a ton of cores. Uh, you know, all of my all the antennas I make, I buy all my cores from Amazon. Um, uh, if you if you talk to Bob at Palomar Engineers, he's a genius. If you really if you really have a core question, call Bob at at Palomar. Don't tell him I sent you. Um, <laughs> so the man's. How, a, a, how much a, a, will a, you pay me not to tell him? <laughs> well, let's talk. Um, so, so, so Bob will be happy to answer your questions, and he's really a, a tremendous resource. Okay, thank uh, you. I think uh, we we've had uh, Bob uh, speak uh, at the club. Uh, George. Oh, good. So, yeah, so, great guy. Uh, Charlie, I think you had a question. Yeah, I have a question. I have a friend who has a thirty-seven foot sailboat, and he asked me about loading up the, the uh, mast as an antenna. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he doesn't think that the mast is connected to the saltwater ground. Um, I'm not totally convinced of that, but assuming it's not, you know, you have the mast and then you have the shrouds. Is it? Is it? Have you know? Do you know of that being done? And if so, do you have any recommendations or observations on that? Yeah, I've never done it myself, but I, I've I've talked to people who who have had some experience with that. Um, and, and some people do load up the mast itself. I, I think the, from what I've heard, and this is just secondhand, I'm, I have no personal experience with it, backstay antennas tend to be better. Uh, and the reason for that, it, I mean, assuming if you have a sailboat, you probably have a backstay, is, you can start with that. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, there are some boats like cat boats where they, have, you know, they don't have jibs, they, don't have, they only have like a main mast with yeah. a main sail. But assuming he's got like a conventional sailboat. Yeah, he does. Um, yeah, he I, does backstay. The, I mean, electrically, the the backstay antenna in a way is better because you know that it's it's a um, a single quality piece of metal, and you can insulate the ends. There's no quite, there's no joints in it, right? With with a mast, with like an aluminum mast, there's going to be all kinds of joints that either are 
possible uh, areas of, of conductivity uh, with other things hitting it, uh, shorting something out, noise. Um, it, it's just going to be more, I think, more fraught with problems, frankly. Yeah, that, that's what I was thinking. You use the back, use the back stay and I don't know where to get them, but I assume you can get insulators made for that purpose. Yeah. Oh, they, they do. I mean, the backstay antennas are a real thing. I mean, I, you could probably buy one for too much money. So maybe you can make one by taking a backstay. And, I mean, I don't know how you, you solder to the, or I don't I have no idea. You clamp yeah, onto okay. it somehow. Got um, yeah, sure. But, but I think the other thing you want to do is make sure the ground is super duper good. So you want to make sure if possible, that if he has a keel ground system, that would be really helpful. That makes a difference. If it were me, I, I, I'm kind of like an over, uh, over anxious neurotic preparer for things like that. I would I would take a 30 foot collapsing fiberglass mast and stuff it in the boat somewhere and, and have a hunk of wire because if for some reason I lost my backstay, I still have an antenna um, and it doesn't take up much room. Uh, so, okay. yeah, I was I was thinking, yeah, that's that sounds like a good idea too. Yeah, I think it'd be a real pain in the neck to set it up every day. So I wouldn't make that my antenna. I would use the backstay, but I would certainly have a backup. Okay. Well, I have an Iridium uh, phone too, but that's that's another thing. Yeah, by the way, it's a great presentation. Oh, thank you. Uh, let's see, uh, Ben, AI6YR has his hand up and so does Greg. So Ben first. Yeah, uh, uh, just a question on the what you use for the, the mid support. I do a lot of backpacking and I haven't found anything ideal that packs and I, uh, maybe you talked about it, but uh, how small does that collapse? And is that something you put in your backpack or do you strap it on the back, back of it? The, the mast? Yeah. Yeah, so the ones that we that we've sold the the pack tena mass, um, they collapse down to 26 inches. Now it's fiberglass. Fiberglass is not super lightweight. I I personally consider it to be a day packable mass. So if I'm going to go on a soda event, and the whole point is to is to operate radio, it's no big deal because it weighs like three pounds or something like that, and I, I could put three pounds in my pack if is a luxury item for the day. If I'm going on a like a week long backpack, no way in, no way am I going to take that. <laughs> so, um, what I would do in that case um, is I would either rely on lobbing the the antenna wire in a tree and hope for the best, or if I really were going to try to take some kind of structure, I'd probably take a carbon fiber pole and use it as a sloper. And the good news is carbon fiber poles are actually surprisingly inexpensive because they they use them for fishing. And so we have the advantage of a big market that helps bring the price down. So there's a lot of inexpensive. By inexpensive, I mean small ones are, you know, $30 and big ones are 120 bucks or something like that. So uh, that's not so bad, all things considered. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, Greg, are you still there? Yeah, uh, there you are. Okay. I got a little comment there for for Charlie. There's been several guys who've uh, been sailing and I've contacted, and not only the backstay and the mast. And, you know, of course, that's a good idea to have a an extra pole, maybe if you had something blow over. But I think if it blew up, blew, blew <laughs> your main your main mast, you'd be paddling, paddling home. But neither here nor there. Take uh, another hunk of coax, uh, strip both ends of it, so you can put the the uh, center and the braid on on the uh, mast if you want and uh, on the very top of where the backstay is if that's insulated where you got the the sloper and, and what you do with that extra piece of coax is just throw it over the side in salt water and it makes a nice good ground uh, okay that uh, it's, it's, it sounds like a, a good uh, good tip yeah thanks okay uh we have mr soda himself ron Hey, uh, George, um, back to your picture of the uh, NFED half wave and the coax being the counterpoise. Uh, we had a situation a while back. We were doing a, a jamboree on the air. We were trying to separate our antennas, and I had an antenna very similar to that, and we used a really long coax. Um, does that get to be a problem? It's not a problem. Really long coax is just, it's more, just more of a signal attenuation. How long a coax are you talking about? Uh, I think we were using either a, a one or a 125 on that. And we had really poor performance. Uh, we set that up for our 40 meter radio and the hams that were running that, uh, it was a hundred watt radio. 
and we're just not making the contacts. And we were trying to figure out later what was going on. Um, I'd gotten it up in a tree pretty high as a sloper, mm. and then it slipped off that branch, and but it still was up there pretty good. And but we we didn't use any counterpoise. Um, it's a ten a very similar design of yours with a, it was a kit. It was a hundred watt limit on it. So um, what kind of coax are you using? Um, RG8U, I think. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it was a good coax. Yeah, I mean, electrically, that should be pretty good. I mean, at HF, the, the loss is pretty minimal. You know, you're probably looking at a couple dB. You wouldn't really notice it, uh, all things considered. So if you had, a, let's say, an NFED half wave on 40 with 100 feet of RG8 as your feed line at 100 watts, as long as you didn't get any RFI back in the at the radio, that should work pretty fine. Okay. I just wondering if, if it was something to do with the, the counterpoise, the coax being longer than the antenna. Yeah. Now that's that's really not a significant factor, uh, frankly. Uh, now, so if you're using it, if it's a half wave and it's resonant, you're gonna you're gonna tune it anyway, and so you're gonna put an antenna analyzer or or maybe even just the radio and look at what the match right. is in the okay. radio, and yeah. you're gonna be you know like adjusting the length, folding it back or nipping it off or yeah. extending it or whatever. And as long as you got a good match on it, then you know it's about as good as it's gonna be. If the performance on that is poor, assuming that the coax is good, there's no water in it or whatever, the connectors are good, then uh, it's probably down to more propagation than anything else. Um, now yeah. it could be that, that you do get some, um, like it, it, it was a 40 meters you said? Yeah, it was 40 we were trying okay. to So remember like, if, if you have a horizontal antenna that's less than a half wavelength above the ground, you're going to cant the, the radiation pattern up, not right. out. So if you were, let's say, on the average 20 feet off the ground, you that antenna wants to be at 66 feet. Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen is you're not going to get a, a tremendous amount of radiation at the horizon. It'll be, you know, you're going to be up at like 45 degrees. So it will make a reasonably good Envis antenna. So you should be able to make contacts regionally, but not like a whole lot of DX. So... Right. Um, yeah, well, I guess I'm just comparing it to other times I've used it, even on lower power, mm -hmm. and it did a lot better. So something was just weird that day, and that was the only thing we did different was use a really long coax. So I was just I was still you trying know, it, to come up with what, what went wrong that day. Yeah, it beats me. I mean, it, I'm assuming the coax was good. I, I've, I've been very unpleasantly surprised where I've bought brand new pre-made coax cables from reputable dealers, and they're bad the the connectors were bad or you know i mean it's you think like you expect everything you buy out of the box is just like fine right you don't you wouldn't give it a like it's got to be me it's not the not my brand new coax for heaven's sakes right and actually sometimes it is yeah. so even good brands i mean sometimes it's just it just happens so maybe maybe there is something something was twisted maybe something was shorted i, I don't know okay good point but, but basically you. that should work fine Okay, thank you. George, can you say what kind of coax you use when you're on the trail? Extended? Yeah, I I exclusively use RG316. <laughs> so um, that's not very common. Uh, my, I, I, so my criteria for super portable is, again, small and lightweight. And the smallest cable that you can get is like RG174 uh, or RG316. RG174, I mean, that stuff is like, you know, you think RG58 small, RG174 is like half that. Um, it's about two tenths of an inch in diameter. Um, that stuff um, is pretty lossy. It's extremely lossy at VHF. Uh, at HF, it ain't great, but we're only talking about 20 feet. So it's not like it's a big deal. RG174 is the more common version of that coax. And it's uh, it's not very robust. It's very... Um, um, it abrades easily. It rips apart very easily. RG three sixteen is the um, is the uh, Teflon version of that stuff. So it has a much more a rugged outer vinyl jacket, um, and it's it's PTFE Teflon uh, insulated. It doesn't make it perform any electrically better, but it's much more uh, robust. And so that's by far my favorite because you can get a tw a twenty foot uh, piece of that coax you know, is in a coil about that big and it's, you know, the, the diameter of all the the pieces is really tiny. If you go to, let's say, RG58, which is not bad, you're really adding about four times, three times the volume and weight for no good reason. You, you, the performance is negligible. 
Uh, and I surely wouldn't go to anything bigger than that, never. The only time I go to bigger coax is if I'm doing a event, like if we're doing field day, weight's not a factor. And what's a factor is somebody stepping on the coax and breaking it. And so I'd go to a bigger coax just for robustness, not because I needed it, but just for, you know, visitors <laughs> to the field day, stepping on it. Um, but if it's just me on, you know, I, again, I'm the guy that cuts the labels out of his shirt. So you better believe I'm going with the tiniest coax I can get away with. Oh, and by the way, that stuff is pretty temperature resistant too. So, um, you know, it, it's like RG174 in, in the bright sunlight, in the heat, gets kind of tacky. And the, this stuff doesn't. Okay, are there any other questions? Raise your hand or unkey. Okay. I don't see, wait a second, N6PK, are you, uh, no, you're not, anybody? All right, George, thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight. It's a My great pleasure. presentation, it's uh, good to see you again. Thanks, Brad, really appreciate it, good to see you too. Okay, well, looks like we, oh, we got, that's uh, not a hand, that's Greg just saying yes. All right, and uh, with that, I've got one final announcement, Be.